This is SciBite, episode 102 for September 17th, 2013. everyone, and welcome to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast, live on Tuesday evenings and fresh on Wednesday mornings over at jupiterbroadcasting.com, and of course, streaming live over jblive.tv. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. So, I know there's been a few stories in the news this week. What are we talking about? I have. (laughs) They're going to take a look at Voyager 1's journey into interstellar space, question mark, <laughs> a possible HIV vaccine, gears in nature, curiosity news, and as always, take a peek back into history and up in the sky this week. I've been waiting all week, so let's dig in to our first news story. I got a hint, an intuition as to what the story might be, Heather, but I'll let you make it official. What is our first news story? So NASA has given an official stamp of approval to the thing that Voyager 1 has entered interstellar space and has actually made and actually made the transition a year ago. Oh, oh, really? Yes. Well, we've heard the yes, no, yes, no yeah. thing going on for a year, pretty much. And so, well, first of all, there's the giant question of where is the, quote, edge of the solar system? Mm-hmm. It's one of those things where they never had a definition of planet for the longest time, and then they just gave addition to, definition to it. But for the solar system, it's kind of a little bit harder because we only have so many ex- experimental data. We only have so much data about. <laughs> I, what I guess is it's where. not like we've it's not like we've crossed this boundary a lot of times before. <laughs> yes, so there's. I mean, so there's, it is really like leaving an onion. There are all these different layers of what's going on. Uh, Heaven's Revenge said it's the heliosphere, mm-hmm. which I'm going to talk about here in a more here in a minute. But it's essentially this another one of these various bubbles around our solar system mm-hmm. as we know it, mm-hmm. with the eight planets now. So, what's going on is the heliosphere. It is a region of space, mostly made of the sun. It's sort of a bubble of charged particles surrounding the solar system. Okay. And I'm moving my arms in a circular fashion, even though you can't see it. Theater of the mind. Yes. Now, these are electrically neutral atoms in the extrasolar volume. So interstellar space has all these electrical neutral atoms. Now, the sun is letting off a... Uh, positively, I believe. They're not neutral. They have a, a charge. Oh. So they're saying, okay, well... When they start we, to drop off, essentially, right? Is that the Yeah, edge? when they start to drop off, when you see the... Yeah, Heaven's Revenge, it's uh, traveling through this magnetic shell. So you can kind of see a point that you say, oh, the charges are different here. Now, a lot of scientists say, yes, arm chopping in air. That is the edge of the solar system. Mm-hmm. Now, some other scientists say, no, it's... The Oort cloud, which is a hypop, uh, they think is a spherical cloud of mostly icy planetesimal, lots of icy chunks, but like 50,000 AU, so 50,000 times the distance that Earth is, which is almost a light year. Now, this Voyager is 17 hours, uh, light hours away from Earth. Mm. So it's kind of this boundary of where it Depends on who, yes, who we decide where the edge of the solar system is. But NASA has given its you know, stamp of approval that crossing that magnetic barrier was the thing. So they are they actually saying it's left the solar system or are they kind of couching it by saying it's left the magnetic, magnetic atomic influence or whatever of the sun? Like, what are they actually no, saying? They're saying it has left the air quotes solar system wow. but the heliosphere we were talking about that giant bubble around the sun that just sort of 
it's everything that's gravitationally, has any gravitational bound by the sun. At the edge of that, then it starts to lose. Another star comes flying by and it can, you know, steal things from that. But that's okay. sort of this, okay. the edge of what the sun's gravity can reach. Mm. And that is what the heliosphere is. So they're saying, nope, we haven't got there, Ben, but we have left what they are marking as the edge of the solar system. Wow. That feels historic. Yes, it most definitely is. It's in interstellar space. You've got all these particles flying around in all these different directions. Now, the sun is obviously sh shooting things out in one direction. Sure. So they say, hey, when we see a switch in the magnetic field, then obviously that'll say, hey, we are seeing the sun's magnetic field here. We cross a barrier. Now it's everywhere. So we're definitely going outside the solar system at that point. Now, one tripping point is what they always kept saying is we need, you know, situations one, two, and three in order for us to say it's out of the solar system. And one of them was a shift in that magnetic field. Now, we really haven't seen a clear change in that. So they're trying, so they, since they hadn't seen that, they're trying to say, well, we could also look at properties of other things like ionized plasma. Mm. So the, the heliosphere of the sun is surrounded by this ionized plasma outside of a certain bubble. Then you get things from, you know, explosions from other stars and things like that. And difference would be that the plasma density, so you have the density of it gets much denser. So they had an instrument that would measure the density of this ionized plasma, except it Stop working in the 80s. Oh. Now, is that because it failed or because they've been kind of slowly shutting things down? No, it actually uh, it actually failed mm -hmm. in the 80s. Okay. So what they're able to do is sort of use a different instrument, use the antenna, and, and kind of get some information from that. Okay. And actually, what happened was they can see coronal mass ejection. So those things where, you know, big chunk, you know, quote big, chunk of the sun flies off and it hits the mm -hmm. earth and create all those beautiful aurora mm -hmm. and magnetically charged. And what they're able to see Crashes is hard drives. Well, yeah, I can crash hard days or power, <laughs> things like that. So there was one that ejected in March of 2012 and it actually went in the direction of Voyager one and hit it like 13 months later. And so in April of this year. So when that hit quote hit Voyager, it's sort of, vibrated the spacecraft just a little bit. So you can see this oscillation like a violin string. And the pitch of that, they're, from the pitch of that, they're able to sort of back calculate and say, all right, here's the density of the plasma oh at my this gosh. point. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So at that point they said, oh my gosh, that's like 40 times denser than hmm. Hmm. What, we expect, what we expected to be there. So they're like, okay, well, Let's, let's backtrack our data. Hmm. So they started going back into the older data and see if they could find other chrono mass ejections and see what it, the data said from that. So they went, all right, let's go back to all the way back to August of 2012 where they saw a chrono mass ejection at that point. And they said, wow, it's actually the same density there as well. So that's why they're saying, well, they think it's actually all the way back in August of last year. Now, there was some indication last year that it was one of the, that it would happen. But because steps one, two, and three were all colliding, they went, well, we're going to hedge our bets for now. Mm. And, you know, scientists almost never agree on anything. <laughs> and even some of the people on the Voyager team that wrote the paper that say, yes, the plasma is dense enough here, even some of those scientists say, I, I think we may be lacking a little bit of enough data. Really? So definitely not everyone agrees. One of the big sticking points is the shift or non-shift in the magnetic field that they are not seeing. So that is one of the main reasons why they're still kind of, there's a lot of hedging bets at this point. You know, um, the day that this story broke, one of the things that was kind of a treat for me is uh, some of the scientists working on this project didn't ask me anything on Reddit. And, oh, yeah. and some of the guys that were answering questions in this thread have been working on this project since 75 and 74. Yep. And so, I mean, they've been there 
you know, forever. So I just, I just, I, re, I, I reflect on that and think of the, uh, the accomplishment and, 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 you know, how proud they must feel for working on this for so long. And, and one of the things that they talked about very matter of factly is that they, you know, now they're kind of transitioning to a mode of, um, prolonging the life of this, of this spacecraft, I guess, or probe or whatever, mm-hmm. as long as possible. Like they're going to start shutting down different instruments and they have been already, but they're going to start shutting down more to, to make sure to, to keep some of the core essentials online as long as possible. And, and what, what struck me about this, not to get, um, very U S centric, but what, you know, what a, what a proud accomplishment for the United States to be the first nation to leave the solar system. And it strikes me that this is the sort of long-term investment that, you know, takes 30 plus years to pay dividends where we start something today and then we don't reap the benefits in terms of space exploration for 35 plus years. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the scale that these kinds of projects operate on is is really impressive. And I, I look at this now and I think it's, pretty exciting to be able to to really achieve something like this within some of the scientists lifetime that have been working they've been working there now and they're also working on other projects as well on other projects so it's really Mm -hmm. kind of this cool combination of being able to witness this within our lifetime even though it's something on the scale of interstellar space travel but it's also really neat in that uh, it's something that nasa worked on really hard a long time ago and and we still today get to be delighted by it i've seen I think I remember talking to someone uh, from NASA or saying that when they have these type of missions that are going to, you know, has the possibility of going really long term, they specifically select a chunk of the team that is younger. Oh, interesting. Because you want you a want chunk them to of the around. team to be able to continue on with the mission as long as it, you know, as long as it might go. I mean, the plutonium wow. fuel that they have mm-hmm. says it can go another seven years. And they'll, that I mean, doesn't they'll seem start, very long. Well, I mean, I know in retrospect it is, but yeah. I wanted to keep going, Heather. <laughs> well, they're going to start shutting down all yeah. the instruments by, yeah. yeah. Um, well, all not the whole thing, but just in all the instrumentation for another seven years. So in 2025, by that time, everything, all the instruments will be turned off, but they'll still be operating the spacecraft mm-hmm. until 2035. That's amazing. At that right? point, they'll just be kind of getting. Basic engineering data, right? Essentially saying, it, "I'm alive. Hey, can you I'm hear working. me? Yeah. Are you alive?" Yeah. And just kind of seeing what happens with the basic information on it. What strikes me, I mean, as so profound though, is, I mean, in theory, this thing will continue on for yep. a very, very long time, perhaps longer than us. And I'm just, I'm blown away that at least at this point in human in human history, we're able to watch it. Right. Yeah. There could be people generations down the road that this is more like a piece of history. Kind of like kind of like for me, the moon landing is right. But this is actually still a, we're still making history with this one. It's really fun. Yes. It's fun to watch that. Oh, well, yeah. Incredibly so. What one of the funny things is Voyager 2 isn't quite outside the solar system. Mm-hmm. It's not at that point yet. They don't know how long it will be. But Voyager 2 actually launched before Voyager 1. By two weeks. So it is Voyager two is the longest running right. instrument, but Voyager one is the farthest. Now some of that is because um, one of them got shot along the plane of the solar system. You know they both kind of use the gravitational swings around various planets to help get them moving, and that's what actually makes them move so fast as they did. One went along the plane of the solar system, and the other one actually went up in a ninety degree angle. So they're kind of in very going very different directions away from the sun so there's also the a, the whole aspect of the bubble surrounding the sun may not be well most likely is not the exact same no matter what, in whatever direction you go to some of that depends upon where the sun is in compared with the whole galaxy mm. so it's kind of rotating around the galaxy and then you get that whole thing where you know there's a rock in a in wa- running water you can kind of see as it loops around the rock and then has a tail a little bit. So that's the kind of thing where you're seeing that. So it'll look differently. It'll have be shaped differently to ma- in whatever direction you're going to. How do they measure that exactly? Like how can they 
I mean, I, I realize they, they must have some sort of instrumentation that's told them these, these are the shapes. But, I mean, when you're talking about... The, uh, looking at other stars. Looking in... I mean, oh. we're able to see in other, you know, parts of the galaxy, in the Orion Nebula. They have... Um, I didn't put it in here. But there's images, what they call the finger... They, you know, they call it fingers of God. And it was these... Where this nebula is shooting off all this... Um, you know, streams of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can see little dots where there is a little black hole in the middle of all this, you know, atoms and things. And it kind of goes around. So that what happens is that is a star that has started its own little solar system type right, thing going right. on. So they can so watch that and, and then So model they can it. watch. And we're seeing, you know, these now extrasolar planets. And so we see all of these various solar systems in different stages of development. So we're able to look out and say, hey, this is what it looks like. This is what we kind of see there. Apply so Apply that model to apply us, Apply right? that model and make a good guess as to what's here. Based on observation. Yep, based on all our observations and extrapolation of data that we're actually getting now from the Voyagers. Gosh, that's cool. Yeah, and uh, if you go to the show notes, in the show notes there's a YouTube uh, video calling... Voyager captures sounds of interstellar space. Oh, you know what? That's so funny that you brought that up because I actually had a, I wrote down a little note to ask you about that in the post show. So this is really interesting because I don't quite grok how they did this, but I caught the mm -hmm. video of it this last week and I don't know why it just, it just uh, hit my radar, but uh, it sounds amazing. It's also kind of creepy. Yeah. Well, essentially what it's doing is saying, here's the frequency of the data that we're having and they make it into, you know, our, make it into an amplified into a way that human ears can hear it. So they, so it's not actually, so, okay, a little bit. So it's kind of like where they take like an infrared image. Here it is, right here. I guess that's actually not as creepy as the one I heard the other night. Oh, that's creepy. Yeah, I was like, wait, oh, that, you the creepy here to Zach. That is creepy. I heard another one that was uh, quite a bit longer. I wonder if... Um, the one that the... Uh, clip that I found was probably just a shorter one that I didn't. Kind of sounds like a horror movie, Heather. A horror here, movie. And, and here comes another one. I think this is, comes right. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a planet making that sound, right? No, that's not a planet. <laughs> oh, that, oh, oh, right, right. That's right. That's that, interstellar space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Sounds of, here we go, Heather. I'm going to play something for you. And oh, no. this, this is what I was talking about. This is the sound of Jupiter. You ready for this? Okay. Okay. It's a little low, but do you hear it? This is Voyager recorded this. Oh, this is the... This is a recording of the, of the sounds of Jupiter by, uh, by Voyager. It's a complex interaction of charged electromagnetic mm -hmm. particles from the solar wind, planetary magnetosphere, combined create soundscapes, and then they move them, like you mentioned earlier, they shifted them into a human range, and this is literally, if you put a mic up to Jupiter, what it sounds like. Because of that, yeah, because of the charges that's going on. It's not sound, quote unquote, as you right, right. It's sort it, of because you know, in space, no one can hear you scream. Yeah. But this is the <laughs> the whole electrical pickup that's going on. And uh, and you read very well from the description underneath the. It, uh, it actually gets creepier. <laughs> Listen to it. This isn't been. This isn't synthesized by a machine necessarily. This is the part. This is the machine interpreting what it's receiving. Mm -hmm. And this is the Voyager that picked it up. Yep. Uh, very fascinating stuff. I mean, that kind of thing is it is it is really cool to listen to. Yep. I had some people tell me about it, and I had someone uh, send in a uh, go to the website and send in a, a form about it. And I was like, "Yep, may have heard something about Voyager One. <laughs> Just maybe." <laughs> Pretty cool. All right. Well, so uh, Heather has more details in the show notes. Anything else on that one? You'll see where we are going to go next and when uh, Voyager 2, 2 joins its partner. Pretty exciting. And Heather has a link to uh, some of the sounds captured by Voyager in the show notes if you guys want to check that out. Oh my goodness. Well, that brings us right now to a quick little break where I just want to remind folks that there is a way you can keep not just SciBite on the air, but all of the Jupiter Broadcasting programming on the air. And that is, in fact, it is so easy. You'd almost think it was impossible to be true. But friends, I'm here to tell you it is true. If you're about to shop at a popular website, like, oh, let's say Amazon or maybe Newegg or let's say ThinkGeek or 
Best Buy. Well, good news. Or Woot.com, if you have, uh, or Monoprice, if you have our browser extensions. If you click on one of the links at the bottom of our website before you shop, it will tag your shopping session to contribute a portion of your purchase to Jupiter Broadcasting. It doesn't cost you any more. We put that into an Amazon account or wherever they pay it out to, and then we pay our bandwidth providers or we pay our partners, whatever it, whatever the business expense is that month, that helps us defer that cost. A lot of times here on the Side by program, though, we don't want to just give you just that when we can arm you with something you might want to purchase. I have a personal gadget that I want to recommend, and I think you're going to hear about some of this if you're a Linux Action Show viewer soon. It's called Foscam, F-O-S-Cam, 80 or actually 75, 76 bucks from Amazon, and it's primable. It is the coolest little toy, and if you've got an iPhone or an Android device, that's all you need to control this thing. Now, you actually, there's lots of good desktop software, including one that we're going to review soon on the Linux Action Show, but... Um, you actually can do a lot of this stuff just from an Android app. And, and stuff is like turn on night vision. And stuff includes rotate the camera and pivot the camera and turn on the microphone. And if you get the little bit nicer version, they even have a speaker and it has built-in Wi-Fi and Ethernet. It's really cool. I've, I've put one out in our studio for experimentation before just to kind of uh-huh. like keep an eye on it. And it's tune in to see what it's doing. But you could do it for security. You could tie it into all kinds of stuff. And it's a great gift to it just under 76 bucks it's like just enough where you're like you show them you care but it's not too much that you're breaking the bank so it's fos cam fos cam now the one that i have here let's see is this the one? Yeah, I think this as he one turns around grabbing yeah it's the f18910 w and what's cool about it is from the android app and there's lots of different apps that do this because it's just a, it's part of a it's an industry standard i can actually pivot the camera head from the app and I can look around and see what my kids oh my are gosh. doing. It's so great. Yeah, I was about to say, you're going to put it in your kid's room. <laughs> yeah, and then totally. even at night when they're like starting to make noise and oh, yeah. roving about. It's got like, night, night vision. vision. Night vision. <laughs> you are playing with your You know your what I'm toys. talking about. You know, yeah. Hot I am wheels watching must you. go away. There is a slightly more expensive version that also has a speaker. So you can, you can send audio. <laughs> Knock it off. What are you doing? Get back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be like... Daddy's a USB camera, and he's yelling at us again. <laughs> Dad's everywhere. <laughs> Anyways, there's lots of great things, of course. You can get on Amazon or any of our affiliated sites. So if you just click that link before you shop or if you grab our browser extension. And by the way, if you have our browser extension, especially on Chrome, you might have to reauthorize it. We've uh, done some updates to make it a little bit better of a netizen and also have included uh, new, shot, new sites like Woot.com, but they do require that you reauthorize the Chrome extension. I haven't tried the Firefox one yet because... Chrome is my main battle axe, but uh, I think you might have to there as well. So uh, thanks and to everybody. Extensions are so helpful if you're like me and you cannot remember a lot of things. I know. And you know what's great? I don't know if I've mentioned this on this show. I've mentioned it on, on the last few times. Um, those extensions, open source, code's available, so anybody in the community can audit to make sure we're not doing anything creepy. But on top of that, we've had smaller communities. Um, uh, I've heard from a couple of churches that have emailed me that have taken the code and have used it so that way the people who attend the church can purchase things that help the church. So they take the code and they just swap out the codes. But I think also like if there's a good opportunity there for schools to grab it where parents oh, yeah. could purchase stuff and then it would help the school or daycares. So it's up on GitHub. It was created by Rikai and uh, there's a lot of opportunities for some of the smaller communities to kind of take that and, you know, benefit their communities as well. So it's kind of a cool deal. It's, it's, uh, neat. it's neat all around, Heather. Yeah. All right, thanks to everybody who supports our network by doing that. And that brings us to the News Bite. Okay, what are we going to talk about in the News Bite? Because <laughs> I'm All good. Right. An HIV AIDS vaccine. Wow. This candidate is actually being developed by a research group at the Oregon Health and Science University. Now, it's very promising. They're being testing right now through non-human, uh, non-human primates. And they've got the primate form of HIV is SIV, which is actually like 100 times more deadly than HIV, but is very similar. So what what they're doing is they're using this cytomegalovirus, we'll call it CMV. It's a common virus already carried by a large percent of the population. And they've discovered by using that, combining it and engineering it, can actually maintain actually to it's able to search out and destroy SIV or in human case HIV infected cells. Wow. And when they gave it 
right now it's they said 50% of the monkeys were given it that they were given the SIV after being vaccinated. So they became infected, but over time it actually their immune system was actually able to overcome it and they were able to eliminate the SIV completely. So what it was doing is what it it was literally immunizing so they still got the virus but their immune system was able to fight back against it. Hmm. Now, at this point, it was only 50%. Now, hmm. it, on one hand, that's... And you had you know, to be vaccinated before you were infected? Uh, yes, but I think there was some evidence that it could work, that it might be able to work Post afterwards as well. Hmm. Interesting. But, so, I mean, they're now saying, all right, well, I mean, all the testing suggests that it's completely, you know, killed off. So... I, I, they are trying to figure out why it was only 50% and can yeah. they affect, make the effectiveness greater and how to move it into human testing. Did you read anything about side effects or anything like that jumped out in the article about like... Uh, uh, nothing was mentioned yeah. uh, greatly, but essentially at this point, even 50%, you know, if you give this to all the HIV infected people and 50% of them are able to kill it off completely, that is... 50% better better than what we have now. There are a few cases of people being, very few, of people being cured, um, mostly when there was a combination, two big ones come to mind. One was a combination of someone who had leukemia, and so they'd had chemo kill off all their immune system, and then they got a bone marrow transplant. And then from there, they were able to actually fight off the infection. Another one from uh, an infant, a young kid who had been treated very, very early in life mm -hmm. and was able to overcome it as well. Mm. So, but this is the, roughly the most promising huge candidate about being able to in, in, get your immune system to be able to fight back. And, and the fact, I suppose, I don't know, that maybe you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess is the fact that they're doing it on monkeys means that, like, it's pretty analogous to what they could do for humans or fairly but it's fairly analogous is it though because it's like a different type of infection it's it's what you call it siv yeah but they, that all translates i guess yeah it roughly translates and what also helps it is that i mean the, there's a major difference that siv is 100 more times deadly so there is some sort of correlation the fact that they are similar ish okay and since HIV is much less deadly that it's huh. very likely to be able to translate. Right. So right. because of that, they're looking to, you know, translate to transition into human testing. Good. That's great to hear, Heather. Um, any other thoughts on that one? No, I'm just kind of waiting to see uh, how that one goes. All right, well, stand by. I got to punch something on this eye by 2000. It's time. Hey. Okay. Looks like we got a little viewer feedback. Ooh. Oh, good. So, Michael Thelen on Twitter sent me a tweet. Sent me a tweet, a tweet about this yeah. natural insect gears. So, to the best of our knowledge, the mechanical gear was invented around the time of 300 BC by Greek math, uh, mech, by the Greeks who lived in Alexandria. <laughs> oh, there you go, math mathematicians. Mechanics. Mechanics. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I tried to say mathematicians, and then my brain went, "Nope, that's the wrong word. Skip over and move ahead." No, I think that's called a. Let's just call that a tongue sector error. <laughs> okay. No, because the great part is the insect. The <laughs> it's this coleopratris, and I really horribly chopped that up into science. It's also known as the plant hopper, uh, which there you we're go. going to go use from here on out. Okay. So what it has is this intricate gearing system that locks the back legs together so it makes them rotate it the exact same instant which means which they use to jump forward mm. so this is actually kind of the first what they believe to be the first functioning gear system ever discovered in nature oh so now nature beat us to it yeah so what it's doing is it's helping coordination the grasshopper the you know the legs are way out to the side and it can jump but these insects have their their legs right behind them. So they have to push forward at the exact same instant, or otherwise they're going to go flying off into one direction or the other. Right, right. 
So in order to do this, what they what they have is these gears. They're located on top of the insect's hind legs, like 10 to 12 teeth, about 80, 8, 80 micrometers wide. That's 80 millionths of a meter. It really does, though, look like a gear when you zoom in. It does. It's so it it really is a gear. It has. The exact, it has... Gosh, nature. Gear, yeah. It has tapers. Now, I mean, these insects, they f- can jump at speed of like 8.7 miles per hour. So they're like jumping at fairly, like 50,000 teeth per second. <laughs> they like cock their little legs back and then into a jumping position and then push forward. And the legs are geared so they jump in exactly the same moment. And then they can go forward. Gosh. Now, that's Actually, cool. only the juveniles that have that function. In the adults, they don't have the gears just as they, the same as the juveniles do. You know, when their little skin molts away and they get to be an adult bug, they have a synchronized and a completely, an alternative mechanism. They're bigger, they're heavier as insects go, and they use some, some sort of friction going on to, go, to synchronize their legs. They're thinking it's probably because these gears are fairly fragile. Yeah, right, yeah. It. And you use them tooth- and you lose them. <laughs> yeah, it's like little teeth. Wear them out. <laughs> and, if, and if one breaks, then the effectiveness has kind of gone down. And it's not such a big problem with the uh, young insects. They repeatedly molt. They grow new gears mm. before they get into adulthood. So when you're the adult mature, then you don't. they don't molt anymore so it's kind of impossible to replace those teeth and it would make jumping ever so much more difficult you know you almost have to see it to believe it you audio folks gotta go look at the notes uh really got to nature had figured it out a long time ago it really is a perfect interlocking gear it's pretty pretty impressive and you know what it makes you realize anytime science is inspired from nature it's usually a good place to start uh, all right. Well, uh, Heather, I was just thinking, while wow, we're just way out there in terms of concepts. Maybe yeah. while we're up in the sky, should we uh, take a ch- an update on, uh, see what Curiosity's up to? Let's go. And lift off of the Atlas V with Curiosity. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. It is. Oh. <laughs> Heather, we're so excited. <laughs> Heather, I watched that live. That's one of the highlights of... Probably the last five years for me. Well, wait, I've had three kids in that time. Dang it. <laughs> All right, what are see, we talking I about? Excuse. I may have been a little excited on that day. Well, you see. Just a little. Uh, the science part of me. It was a highlight for the science part of yeah. me, Heather. So I, I know, I know it's a little bit of a slow time for curiosity, but there must be something to talk about. There is. We are on a road trip right now. It had the starting area that they called Yellowknife Bay, and that's kind of in the, that's where they did six months of investigating right there. And they said, all right, our goal is that mountain way over there, Mount Sharp. So they said, okay, it's going to take about a year to get there. Oh. So we're kind of in a road trip mode. Now they did use the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to kind of spy out a travel path and say, all right, this is where we should go. This is where it's safe. This is where it's interesting. And they said, hey, we're going to mark five points that they're going to stop briefly. So... They say, all right, this is waypoint one, waypoint two, and we've got to reach waypoint one. Now, they don't plan to, like, go into the drilling mode in any of these locations unless something really, really crazily exciting is there. Mm -hmm. But so they they went to this point, and so now they've just arrived there at waypoint one. They're calling it Darwin. So they're kind of stopping. They'll be there for a couple days. We'll... Martian days, which they call souls. And they'll get some data. They'll... But, so they're about 20% of the way there at this point towards the mountain. So it's, it's all about getting the data of... We see that water flowed through this area. Hmm. So hmm. how... What is the... What did the water look like as it flows through here? And then all the way up to the top of this, what they... You know, what they're calling a mountain. So see... The word keeps jumping out of my brain. Because get an overall view of what was going on through this entire area. Now, can I ask you a really beginner newbie question? So are, are soul days, are souls, are those the same? Like, is a soul the same on Jupiter as it is on Mars? 
No. Or, okay. What they what they call a day is re- literally the time it takes to, for the, for say the, you have. Right. So it's relative make, to the planet for going around the sun. Make a dot on a planet, how long it yeah. takes yeah. to rotate. Okay. I mean, there is, some of them, a, a year is shorter than a day. Okay. What, what? Wait, a year is, sh- so a, a take, year? In order for the, uh, I believe, now I'm going to, I'm going to make it all sad if the science is lifting my brain. Ugh, Mercury. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Super fast yeah, rotation. I think so. Yeah. So, yeah, it's orbiting the sun. It's going, it makes one trip around the sun faster than the poor little planet can rotate itself around. Right. Right. Yep. That sounds right. So, hmm. so a soul, it's. So a, a soul is relative. It, it's all very relative. Mm-hmm. Now, Mars is fairly close to Earth. Right. And for a while there, the scientists were matching themselves up to a day on Earth. I mean, uh, the Mars. Right, I remember that. So then they finally went to a point where they're like, okay, we can all get normal days again. <laughs> huh. uh, there was actually a watchmaker who was able to make a watch run on a Martian clock time, which is way more difficult than you might think. And there was an app for that, too. There was an app for that. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Up for that and heaven's revenge in the chat room asks is that really mars now a lot of the pictures you're seeing from curiosity don't have that great you think it's huge red hue right you know, it's black and white it's, it's red or grayscale not not just the grayscale ones but the color images and they're calling it white balanced oh so you see a little cool. blue in the rocks and whatnot yeah you you can see that and it doesn't look as red as you think it should mm-hmm. it's because they've taken it and they've Translate it into, say, hey, let's pretend we took this chunk of Mars and put and it on Earth. It on Earth with a blue atmo- so, with a blue atmosphere and yeah, with you know, it doesn't have the red atmosphere and things. Now, sort of, it's so that scientists can look at it and they feel like the geologists can say, hey, that looks like this. Hey, that looks like that because it's right. much it's stuff they've recognized. Good. Yeah. Now it makes some people sad. Like it's disingenuous it's- in a sense, okay. though. It's disingenuous in a little bit, isn't it? I mean, because it's not what it actually looks like. Well, in a sense, yes and no. Is it what it is doing? Is it's making it more feasible? They're putting out both. They're putting out the yeah, regular image right. and no. White. I'm not saying they're trying to trick anybody, but it is. It is weird to go to a place and take a picture of it and then make that place look like if that place was here. Yeah, it is what it is. But I mean. And they do it, I'm totally like what you're saying, so that way they can recognize the object. I mean, I get the reason for it. It is a little weird, yeah, though. Yeah, so they can look out and get a quicker view of everything and be like, yes, 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 no, ah, there. Instead of taking a little bit longer to kind of realize what they look like yeah. on Earth, uh, Mars versus Earth. Speaking of time, are you ready to jump in the time machine? Let's go. Oh, oh, buckle in, Heather. <laughs> a little bit of a tingle. Not gonna lie, you know they always say you shouldn't eat too much before you time travel. This Uh-oh. this week it takes us to 167 years ago, September 23rd, 1846. Heather, what the heck happened this week in science? Neptune was discovered. A German astronomer, Johann Gell, discovered Neptune after only an hour of searching. Really? Within one degree, that's one pinky held at arm's length. So he looked at that much sky. And after an hour, he found it. Now, what happened is that they had uh, an English astronomer had actually independently calculated the size and the position. Say, okay, based upon the irregular orbit of Uranus, we think there is something this big orbiting right here that it would affect the the orbit of Uranus this much. Hmm. So they were like, okay, we think it should be this size and it should be here. And sure enough, they looked out there and in less than an hour, they found it. I feel like I, it should be. I don't know, Heather. I feel like I could have done that. I mean, if I was alive 167 years ago. Right. hundred. Yeah. I mean, granted. <laughs> I'll give okay, you that. Okay, let's give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. And <laughs> let us use calculators and computers in the internet. I got that, Heather. I got that. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, there You're you go. An abacus. I, I feel like I feel like that's worthy of documenting. Neptune discovered 167 years ago. That's absolutely incredible by a German, nonetheless. So uh, there you go. All right. Well, with that filed, let me retune the side by 2000. That way we can look up into the sky this week. Right. The planets are doing a showdown this week. 
We've got Mercury low in the glare of a sunset. You may or may not be able to spy him. Mm. We've got uh, Venus and Saturn hanging around evening twilight, low into the west-southwest sky. Venus is going to be the brighter of the two. Saturn this week is going to be to the upper left. With its little, uh, you can remember, Venus is the brighter, Saturn has its ring, so maybe it's flying a little bit higher. And it's actually going to be moving to the upper right of Venus. So it's kind of going to the upper left to the upper right as the week goes by. You'll be able to see it kind of move in relation to. Mars, if you're up at 3 Mm a.m. local time, you look to the east, it'll be far to the lower left of Jupiter. And Jupiter around 1 a.m. local is going to be moving high to the east to southeast as it goes towards dawn. So if you are up in the wee early hours of the day, then you could check out Mars and Jupiter. There you go. At 3 a.m. and 1 a.m. respectively. Jeez Louise. Of course, if you're up and you see something up in the sky and you think, gosh, what the heck was that? That sure looked cool. Well, I got a little bit of advice for you. A little bit of it. Here's a pro tip. Pro tip. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. Look for SciBite 102. And when you click on that, scroll down to the bottom of those show notes. Heather has all of that outlined. So when you spot that thing up in the sky, you go there and find out what it is. I love that. Right. All right, Heather. Well, I think that brings us to the end of this week's show, doesn't it? I think so. Awesome. Well, a great show. I want to remind everyone you can email us, SciBite at jupiterbroadcasting.com or hit that contact link at the top of our website. And don't forget, we're live over at jblive.tv Tuesday evenings. Just go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar for the schedule. Heather, thanks for the great show. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of SciBite. We'll see you right back here next week. 